the polar bear, the world's largest land predator, is under threat. As the Arctic warms, the icy habitat of the bear is melting faster, leaving them hungry and vulnerable. Their population is dwindling as they struggle to survive the longer summers. And now, starving bears are coming into towns searching for food. I've come to their world to find out how they're coping in a fast-changing climate. Can they survive and adapt, or will the mighty polar bear become a climate casualty? I'm heading to Canada's far north, to the Timberline, where trees give way to Arctic tundra, and the view of the northern lights is at its most spectacular. I'm landing in Churchill, Manitoba, the polar bear capital of the world. It's summertime here, and Arctic fox and snow geese can be seen in the rugged wilderness that's all around. Right off the coast, hundreds of beluga whales are gathering to feed and give birth to their young. I'm surrounded by beluga whales here. Wow, very, very close to the kayak. Belugas and polar bears share the same habitat. This is Hudson Bay for half the year. It's the ice-covered hunting ground of the polar bear. The polar bear, of course, is the Ursus maritimus, the marine bear, and they're very comfortable in the water. But this time of year, they're pretty much landbound, wandering the coastline in a state of semi-hibernation. They forage for what little food they can find while they wait for Hudson Bay to freeze over in the winter. Then they can return to their preferred habitat, the sea ice, and start hunting for seals again. But temperatures are rising worldwide, so their habitat is changing, which puts their future at risk. The Arctic regions are warming at twice the rate of the global average. Some scientists say that we could be losing 4% of our sea ice every 10 years. That could have a devastating effect on the polar bear populations. There are an estimated 25,000 polar bears in the world, and they depend on sea ice for survival. They're the most majestic animal in the Arctic, and they've evolved over a long period of time from grizzly bears to take advantage of the special and unique habitat of sea ice. It's a rich hunting ground for the bears. They almost exclusively hunt ring seals on sea ice in the winter. That's their primary source of energy. And so the sea ice becomes a very important part of the habitat of the polar bear. But now, with warmer air temperatures, the ice has been thawing earlier and freezing later in the waters around Hudson Bay. Less ice for less time means the bears are trapped on land for longer without access to the high-fat food they need. I want to find out more about how bears survive during these increasingly long summer months, so I'm joining up with Matthias Breiter, a biologist and expert in polar bear behavior. We've come 250 miles south to a favorite resting spot for southern polar bears. Matthias has been working with the polar bears here for 20 years and will try to get me as close as is safely possible to observe the bears without stressing them. All right, for our bear excursions, we've got this crazy machine. Eight-wheel drive will go anywhere, over anything. You'll notice there is no sides. There's no protection, really. A bear standing up is 10, 11 feet. He's somewhere up there. Yeah. Perfect chewing height. <laughs> Perfect chewing height. We head out. The bears that are in this area are part of the Western Hudson Bay population, made up of about 1,000 bears. Their habitat covers around 1,000 square miles. It's not long before a bear comes into view. We've spotted a bear that's over by the river. It's moving this way, so we're going to go out ahead of the bear, turn off the vehicles, get out on the ground, and hopefully the bear will come to us. So how far will they go inland? Juvenile males. 300 kilometers easily. Males, when they get in reach sexual maturity, they look for new places. When you're young, you test a lot of things, and mostly you screw up. But occasionally you get lucky. That sounds like, that sounds like my teenage years. Now, one of your specialties is getting up close to bears in the wild on foot. Some people think you're crazy. They are the largest land carnivore on Earth. The thing is that people generally are interpreting curiosity as aggression. And then if you behave wrong, you can actually turn a purely curious approach into a very dangerous encounter. With the bear in sight, we make our way towards it on foot. It's on the move. We need to play it safe for our sake, but also 
We don't want to disturb the bear. Matias, do you think it's male or female? I think it's a male. Uh, probably 800 pound bear. As well as observing them, I want to see what the bears are feeding on during these extended warmer months to get a sense of how the loss of sea ice is affecting their health. Polar bears spend about four months living on land. So while they're here, we want to see what types of food they're ingesting. And the best way is to A, observe them eating, but B, examine their scat. And we can actually see what kind of nutrients they're getting, what food they're eating. I'll be taking my samples to the lab at the Winnipeg Zoo for further analysis. As we collect more and more scat, we'll have a better sense what bears have been eating. So what are they eating in the summer? There's been lots of talk about kind of switching to alternative and terrestrial food sources. So how big a role does that play? What's going into those scats? What's, what's supporting those different bears? We know they eat grass in the summer, but with the warm months getting longer and longer, will this diet be enough for them to survive on? Gathering samples will help us find out. Right now, the bear is just curious, sitting on the sand. Now he's gonna poop. It's pooping. Fresh bear poop, yes. Of course, we have to get to it. Doesn't seem to be too interested in us, so we're gonna try and get up close to where we saw it drop that scat, so. Isn't that nice poop there? And the bear decided to stop. The bear is quite close, but as long as we don't do anything to alarm him, he should be okay. Just in case, I've got my bear banger here. Shoots off a flare. Hopefully, won't need it. This bear is too close for us to safely collect the sample right now, and it looks like it's got no plans on leaving anytime soon. There's no reason to run off. Running off takes a lot of energy. You don't want to stress them. They don't have energy to waste at this time of the year. We decide to wait it out. So the whole life of a polar bear is totally retention of energy. What's the lean times for them right now? They're very lean time. They need to conserve their energy because, for the most part, they're living off their own fat reserves stored up from last season's hunt. Uh, should I be worried that I have a seal blubber energy bar in my pocket right now? Well, I'm 100% convinced you have any seal blubber, anything. This bear would be run over here. It's like ringing the dinner bell. As their fat reserves run low, the question now becomes, can the Hudson Bay polar bear adapt to survive? These scat samples will provide invaluable information, but this bear isn't making it easy. He's just hanging out. Um, one thing I can do is mark this location on my GPS, and we could always come back and grab the sample. Sometimes we have limited options. So I'll just give this point a name, location. OK, bear poop 01. We move on to look for more bears. We spot two near the vehicles. They both look very big, healthy. They look healthy. It's early in the season, so they would have just come off the ice not that long ago, so they probably still have a belly full of... They have probably been feeding reasonably well until about a month ago. Now they lose two pounds a day in weight. We can try to get ahead, but if he keeps on following her, they'll just... Yeah, I think they're, they're gone. We go east. Uh, slow down, slow down. <laughs> look at those claw marks. That's so big. They cannot retract their claws. No, they cannot. They're permanent. They're always out. Very cool. Let's follow them. All right. We follow the tracks and are led to a big male polar bear. Oh, here he goes. There he gets He's up. He's getting up. But this encounter soon gets a little too close for comfort. Yeah. OK. Hey, Doug. I'm in northern Canada, in polar bear country. I need to collect scat samples to gauge the impact of climate change on the bear's diet. But if I disturb this one, I could be in trouble. Matthias, do you think it's male or female? A large male in its prime. We watch the bear as it rests for more than an hour. He seems a little more active now than he was a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. That's three yawns now. Can be slightly nervous yawn. That can mean that he is going to get up and approach us a bit. So what do we do if he does get up and start approaching us? We'll do a little few steps towards him. If we back up, he'll just come faster. Right. Polar bears can run up to about 40 kilometers per hour, but only in short bursts. So if that bear really wanted to run, 
it could be here in the blink of an eye. I want him to relax back down. And there he gets He's up. He's getting up. This 900-pound bear is a ferocious predator. It's nerve-wracking being this close. A little bit of displacement behavior. So he's just chewing on the grass right now. It's like if there's something you want to do, but you don't really dare. And so you jump to another behavior. He was just sort of thinking about us. He's hesitating. Oh, you, don't, you don't want to create fear. Fear can re result in aggression. Now he's lying back down. So he's, so if I were to suddenly start running away from him. In all likelihood, he'll run after you. You think so, huh? 95%. Really? Oh, here he goes. Here he goes. OK. If he gets off the grass, we have to make a step towards him. Walking towards a polar bear goes against every instinct. Come on. No. If we're wrong, we could be killed. Uh, he'll try to come again. So just look big. Yeah, when he, when he tries to hook in, I make a little step towards him. You kind of want to keep the pressure a little bit on him. Now he tries to hook again a little bit. I put a little of pressure on him. That's amazing. You want to be dominant. Any kind of movement towards another bear is always dominance behavior. I'm steering him away. And now he's made up his mind. He's gone. He's gone without creating stress. My heart was racing. You've done this hundreds of times before, but I've never actively moved towards a polar bear that is coming towards me. And a male one. A big male, yeah. I mean, if you understand a little bit how bears interact with other bears, it's they're reasonably predictable. People just do not read their language right. With that crisis averted, we go back to collect the first scat sample. It's not just the bears of Hudson Bay that are seeing deteriorating ice conditions. It's a problem all over the Arctic. The minimum sea ice recorded in 2015 was 1.7 million square miles, about 40% less than the previous 30-year average. The global temperature that we've seen of the planet, the rise of global temperature, is about 0.7 degrees Celsius. In the Arctic, it's about two and a half to three times that. And the reason for that is when you cover that surface with this white sea ice, you're reflecting all that energy from the sun back to space, so it keeps it cool. Open it up, that energy goes into the surface of the ocean, and it warms things up. That's a big change. The loss of sea ice would cause a major break in the chain of life in the Arctic. Sea ice is an integral part of the Arctic food web, providing habitat for microorganisms like ice algae and zooplankton. Algae attaches to the bottom of the ice and becomes food for fish and marine mammals. Those fish sustain seals, and seals sustain polar bears. Polar bears are at the top of the food chain, but scientists are predicting that the Hudson Bay population could disappear by 2050. For now, I have the opportunity to observe them up close. It's the one spot in the world where you can see polar bears in the wild, not on the ice, so it's a really unique spot. The bear we tracked this morning moves on, so we can safely collect the sample. Here's the scat. was able to get the sample and out of there perfectly safely without disturbing the bear, really. Specimen bag until we get it to the zoo lab. Perfect. What we find in these samples could provide vital clues to help determine the bear's chance of survival. But getting this close to the bears is dangerous work. So she's coming right towards us. The polar bear has been broken down into 19 different regions that scientists recognize. And of those 19, 10 of them are here in Canada. So it's an excellent place to study polar bears and how climate change is affecting their population. And it's the bears here in western Hudson Bay that are the most at risk of extinction. Their southerly location means they're bearing the brunt of the effects of climate change. Their numbers have declined by 22% since the early 1980s. Over the last 30 years, the amount of time that that open water season is in Hudson Bay is now about four weeks longer than it used to be. And there was some very dramatic uh, observations of bears in very critical condition because they've had to fast for so long. They're, they're not getting enough energy, and so that creates problems with mortality. In a few weeks' time, temperatures will drop and the ice will start to form on the bay. Hundreds of hungry bears will converge along the shores close to the town of Churchill in anticipation of the coming ice. And for Churchill's polar bear alert program, that's a problem. 
So the longer it takes for the ice to form on the bay, the busier we are. Oftentimes, you'll drive along this road, and there will be a bear just right there. Brett Willock is taking me on one of his bear patrols. He's covering a three-mile perimeter around Churchill, making sure hungry bears don't make it into town. The one last night, it was about 5.30 in the morning where our staff was called and they chased it away. Hundreds of bears gather on the coast, but it's usually the more desperate bears and juveniles that come into town to scavenge for food, bringing them dangerously close to people. When was the last time that someone was actually attacked by a bear and injured? Two years ago. It can be a terrifying experience. Locals carry arms and avoid walking alone at night. In the most recent attack, two people were severely injured by a polar bear in the early hours of the morning. And when you're built right on the coast of Hudson Bay, it, it happened. Most bears are coaxed away before they make it into town, but some become problem bears, and Brett and his team have to trap and relocate them. He shows me one of his traps. Right now, we're only using the one. And how many bears do you trap? per year, approximately. It depends on how many bears are around. Yeah. It could be 30 bears, it could be 70 bears. Trapped bears are taken to the holding facility, weighed, tagged, and then relocated. Many are malnourished. Locating high energy food is key to the survival of the polar bear. The lack of sea ice is forcing some bears to migrate north to colder regions with better ice conditions. Recent DNA evidence found genes of the southern bear in the high Arctic. We can probably expect to see either loss or much lower numbers of polar bears in places like Manitoba, and then maybe higher densities of polar bears in Greece Fjord or places that are really in the high, high Arctic. But if polar bears can find new food sources, there may be hope for the population here. We head back out along the coast to see more bears and collect more samples. Not far down the beach, we encounter a sow and her cub. The mother and cub keep wandering sort of west along the coastline. Warmer weather for Hudson Bay has another catastrophic impact on females and their cubs. Increased spring rains can collapse their maternity dens, reproduction rates are down, and cub mortality is up for the Hudson Bay bears. So you can see the, the sniffing. Yeah. Now she's coming right into the scent, coming right towards us. She'll never come all the way up. No. Their priority is to keep the cubs safe. Bears are opportunists, so curiosity is exceedingly important when finding new food sources. So that is just their nature. They're curious. I always keep a look around. You never know. There could be a bear lying anywhere in the bushes and catching our scent. And you'd never see it until, no. you know? It's as far as she wanted to come. While we observe them walking the tide line, we get lucky. They're both pooping? Both of them pooped simultaneously. It was like a synchronized pooping. We wait till it's safe to go in and get the sample. Really fresh. I'll just mark this. Awesome. On our way back, we see a polar bear finishing off what looks like the remains of a snow goose. We know that a handful of polar bears have been spotted hunting and catching caribou and eating berries as black bears do. But are they making a real transition to more land-based foods or are these just opportunistic meals? Our next step will provide the answers. We're heading to Winnipeg to have the scat analyzed and find out if the Hudson Bay polar bears can be adapting to a swiftly warming climate. With scat samples in hand, we arrive at the lab at the zoo in Winnipeg to find out if the Hudson Bay polar bear population has a future. Let's take a look at this. We got a bunch. We pull out all the samples for Dr. Peterson and log them. Female. We just have to make sure that we switch gloves between samples just in case we're going to use these for genetic analysis. He loads the first sample into the microscope. There's been lots of discussion about summer food sources, bird species and stuff, so I'm always curious to see if something like that shows up Goose as well. Eggs. Yeah. He analyzes and compares each sample. Yeah, pretty, pretty consistent. It looks much the same as the other ones. The grass, I don't see anything else in there. It's salad, which is totally not what you think of when you think of a bear. Every sample we analyzed was composed of a grass called sedges. The grass gives them liquid, but no nutrients. The longer they eat grass, the more their body condition deteriorates. So the idea that polar bears will be able to adapt to life on land without sea ice is really not practical. 
No, but we're not going to see all the polar bears shift over to grazing and these other food sources in a short time period. Ultimately, polar bears need to be out on the ice getting seals, and if they're not getting to it or they're getting to it for fewer weeks or fewer months, it's going to have big like population level um, impacts. Without the ability to adapt to new food, the future for many polar bears is looking bleak. At the current rate of climate change, even the most northerly sea ice will melt completely in the summer, and the polar bears will have nowhere left to go. For the first time, an animal at the very top of the food chain could be wiped out by climate change. It's up to everyone, individuals, companies, and countries, to continue to reduce the causes of climate change and save the polar bear. Hostile weather is nothing new to Bangladesh. Seasonal rains and tropical storms hit its low-lying coast and flood its many waterways annually. But as temperatures rise worldwide, our weather is becoming more volatile, and nowhere is that felt harder than Bangladesh, a country being battered so fiercely by the effects of climate change that their existence is under threat right now. Bangladesh has been forced to take extreme measures to survive its battle against climate change. But will it be enough? I've traveled halfway around the world, this time to Bangladesh. I'm on the southern tip of Bola Island, where the land ends and the Bay of Bengal begins. And of course, I'm traveling in the monsoon, the heaviest part of the rainy season. The sky has opened up, and it is coming down in buckets. About 80% of Bangladesh's yearly rainfall occurs during monsoon season, which lasts from June to October. By the end, almost one-third of the country is underwater. And now, climate change is making the rains more unpredictable and intense. Yeah, it's raining pretty hard, isn't it? Yeah, it's okay. I'm joined by translator and guide, Riazul Hook. I'm totally ready to cope with the rain. Bangladesh receives 80 inches of rain per year, making it one of the wettest places on Earth. Bangladesh is a country that has been shaped by water. The entire country is basically a river delta. It's crisscrossed by 700 rivers and innumerable streams and tributaries. Meltwaters from the mountain ranges in the north flow into the lowlands below, where they reach the largest bay in the world, the Bay of Bengal. 80% of the country is low-lying, with much of the coastal region just over three feet above sea level. The land is made up of silt, a soft mixture of sand and sediment, making it prone to flooding and erosion. Whoa, very difficult to walk in. This fine silt has been deposited here. Some of it local, some of it will have even come all the way from the glaciated areas of the Himalayas, thousands of miles to the north. As a result, the land here is very fertile, but also very fragile. As climate change takes hold, more water is flowing down from the mountaintops. River banks are swelling, making tides more dangerous, all of which are hitting the shores of Bangladesh hard. We're losing a lot of the land to the water. Bangladesh is a country that might very well be disappearing right in front of our eyes. The effects of erosion can be seen everywhere, but you can see almost a sharp knife edge where the riverbank has just been slowly carved away. Every high tide, a little more goes out. Every storm, a little more goes out. It's eroded back right to the edge of the road. Chacha, your name is Chacha? Muhammad Akbar Ali Sana. Muhammad. His name is Muhammad Akbar Ali Sana. He has been living here for 19 years. 19 years? Uh, when he settled here first time, his house was 20 feet from here. That's where the house used to be? Yeah, 20 feet that way. And it just keeps having to move it back? Yeah, it's moving back towards the road. A large population and lack of space means thousands of people are forced to live in these exposed places. Alamjir Hussain is a climate change specialist from the UN Bangladesh Development Program. We have 19 coastal districts and roughly 60 million people live here. A recent study shows that, you know, if the sea level rises by 80 centimeters, 
uh, and if there is no action, uh, then at least Bangladesh will lose around 17% of its land mass. If I only consider the coastal part of Bangladesh, then roughly around 80% of the coastal arable land will be gone. With seas predicted to rise between 30 to 80 inches by the end of the century, it's a very real threat. Already, the sea is encroaching, and you can see how the locals are desperately trying to hold back the water. As they put up these wooden protection barriers along the riverbank, and it's basically a last-ditch, desperate attempt to keep what remaining land they have from falling into the river. It seems to be working for now, but I don't think it's going to hold for too many more years. As sea levels continue to rise, protecting the coast and its communities is key to this country's survival. And nowhere is this more important than the Sundarbans region, which has the largest mangrove forest in the world. I'm heading west to see Bangladesh's best natural protection against sea level rise and storm surges. The Sundarbans covers 4,000 square miles. 60% is in Bangladesh and 40% in India. It's home to over 500 species of animals, including the endangered Bengal tiger. All morning I've been seeing different fishermen set up with their boats in the middle of the river. The area is rich in natural resources, like fish, providing a livelihood for the three million people who live in the surrounding communities. We head deep into the jungle. We've taken the boat out early, 5.30 this morning, gone upstream a bit, and now we're just letting it, the current take us downstream very quietly. There's this strange glowing orb in the sky that I haven't seen in many, many days. <laughs> the sun has actually decided to make an appearance. This vast forest provides an important natural protection to the coast of Bangladesh. Mangrove trees can grow in salt water and low oxygen soil. Their dense root system helps stabilize the coastline and reduces erosion and damage from waves and storms. But now, increased erosion throughout the region is causing unsustainable amounts of sediment and silt to enter the waterways that flow through the forest. And the protective mangrove trees are suffocating. Dr. Khan tells me why. These creeks are like uh, blood vessels. And the problem is because of the continuous siltation, these uh, creeks are silted out. And once the creeks are silted, the, all the mangrove roots are blocked. And these are the breathing organs for mangrove plants. Mm. Roots are blocked, they cannot breathe, so they die. 200 years ago, the Sundarbans measured about 6,400 square miles. Now, it's down to a third of its original size. Of course, this loss of habitat is having a big impact on the animals that live here. The tiger population has drastically shrunk by 40% in only 10 years. So there are actually a lot fewer tigers than was originally thought. That's, a, that's not a very big population between 100 and 200 individuals. No, it's not a big population. If the tiger is gone, there will be too many deer, and they will graze all the seedlings. That's why there will be no regeneration. Mm. That will be a catastrophic event. That will be from the apex to the bottom. Saving the mangrove forest and the creatures that live in it is essential because without it, a huge chunk of the Bangladesh coast will be rapidly swallowed by the sea. Hundreds of animal species won't survive, and millions of people will be displaced. But erosion and rising sea levels are not the only climate-related issue threatening Bangladesh. The monster cyclones that blow through every year bring a whole other level of destruction. Bangladesh is a country battered by fierce weather that sweeps in across the Bay of Bengal. Cyclone season lasts from August to November, bringing massive storms. But now, as climate change takes hold, they're getting more fierce and unpredictable. Cyclones are what we would call hurricanes. The people that live here are about as vulnerable to these massive cyclones as anyone in the world. It's hard to imagine a population of people more exposed to the elements. Cyclones are a product of heat and moisture. They form in the warm Indian Ocean just before and after monsoon season. As climate change warms the sea, cyclones and tropical storms get worse. The damage from past storms can be seen everywhere as I travel to meet those affected by the extreme weather here. And the spot I'm visiting today is Charfesong Orphanage. 70 boys make this place their home. 
Shirajul Islam is the director of the orphanage. What were the circumstances that caused the orphanage to be formed in the first place? The orphanage is established uh, in, uh, after uh, Cyclone uh, 1970. Uh, more than uh, 300,000 people uh, uh, died uh, in this area. The 1970 Bola cyclone was the deadliest tropical storm in history, with a storm surge of up to 30 feet. And since then, globally, the number of cyclones has tripled. Here in Bangladesh, hundreds of people are killed each year by storms. Most so, of uh, the students are lost uh, their father in the Bay of Bengal. So most of their fathers were fishermen? Yeah, fishermen. The country has been hit by 10 cyclones in 16 years. The last one was in 2007, when Cyclone Sadir tore through the south, devastating communities. It also coincided with some of the worst monsoon flooding the country had seen. What would you do with the orphans, with the boys, if a cyclone was coming two days from now? We have a, uh, one building. Our boys can take shelter in there. There are cyclone shelters all over the country now, and they've drastically reduced deaths from storms. In spite of the hardship they've faced, the future for these kids is optimistic. Our boys are doing good results, so they are doing hard work. And our boys are uh, is loving the orphanage. Uh, they can play. So they have a good place to stay. They make friends, they get educated to better themselves that they can now get good jobs. Every year, the seasons bring tremendous change to the landscape here. And as we move forward, those changes are gonna become more and more drastic as climate change continues to creep on and have its effect here in Bangladesh. One place where these changes are incredibly apparent is the village of Kukri Mukri where a project is underway to save homes and livelihoods from the damage caused by climate change. Here, storm surges regularly wash away houses, flood farmlands, and render crops useless because of saltwater intrusion. When salinity intrudes, you know, the agricultural production of Bangladesh significantly will impact. Uh, one other major challenge associated with salinity intrusion is right now with availability of fresh water and fresh water for drinking. You know, Bangladesh is called a land of rivers. Water is everywhere, but right now in Bangladesh, still uh, around 20 million people in the coastal belt is suffering from crisis of drinking water. Alamjir takes me around the village to see what they're doing about it. So is this the embankment here? Yeah, this is the embankment here. It's around yep. 14 kilometers long. The sea is on that side. In order to protect themselves, a thick embankment made from mud has been built all around the community with the help of the UN. So I could follow this embankment now all the way around the perimeter of the island for 14 of kilometers? 14 kilometers, you can, yes. Impressive. Just two years back, nothing was here. It provides a wall of protection from saltwater intrusion and storm surges 10 feet high. Ponds have been dug to collect the rainwater during the monsoon. Yeah. So this acts as a freshwater reserve. This water can be, you know, purified through, there are very simple techniques. This land normally would not have been very useful, but now there are fish in the pond and there's vegetable gardens all the way ringing around. There are 10 similar projects across the south, but for many along the coast, the flooding can't be stopped and they're forced to flee. Thousands of displaced Bangladeshis head to Dhaka every year and the mass influx is creating an entirely new crisis. Dhaka, the crowded capital of Bangladesh, where according to the NGO Coastal Watch, every hour, another 11 Bangladeshis arrive after losing their homes to rising seas. It's a global problem. Experts predict that by 2050, 250 million people worldwide will be forced to move due to the effects of climate change. 10% will be in Bangladesh. There are some studies going on really to find out climate-induced migration. They can't really afford to have a sustainable livelihood, so they're moving out. The population of Dhaka is exploding. There are 14 million people crowded into 180 square miles, making it one of the most densely populated cities in the world. The city's infrastructure can't keep up. We hail a rickshaw to go and see how the people hardest hit by climate change live. With so many people in Dhaka, jobs are scarce, and many earn just $2 a day pulling rickshaws. For the low-income people, they can pull the rickshaw and they can't make the money. Many of them live in the poor neighborhoods, like the one I'm being taken to. 
part of Dhaka is known as the Bola Slum, and it's named after the island of Bola, where most of these people who live here have relocated from. It was originally built for people left homeless by the devastating 1970 cyclone, but now it also houses people who have simply lost their land from the encroaching sea. This place is totally a labyrinth. It's the definition of hardship. There's only one electricity supply and very little clean running water. This is what life is like for three million people living in Dhaka. It's kind of heartbreaking to see because so many families live in just such terrible, poor conditions here. A lot of these people don't have a lot of choice but to come to places like this. Even though Dhaka isn't on the coast, it's surrounded by water and extremely vulnerable to the effects of monsoon rains. And the more that falls, the harder life becomes. I find my way to the home of the Kasham family, who fled Bola 16 years ago. Now, they live next to the city's drainage canal, which regularly overflows in the rain. It is the wall of mm -hmm. Dhaka water sanitary system. Okay. Here, there's the pumping system, end of this canal. In Kalesh, you see, the, they have the pumping system. So this area almost go underwater every year. Here, on the other side of the other wall? Other side, and then come inside. Water level goes up to that mark. You oh, see wow. the dirt? Wow. They were flooded, and this area was submerged around mm -hmm. for 11 days maximum, once. Even in here, people can't escape the ravages of climate change. If monsoon rains become as intense as predicted, Dhaka won't be a safe refuge for long. I leave, and as I head to the port of Dhaka, my journey is slowed down, not by the weather, but by celebration. Bangladesh has the fourth largest Muslim population in the world and is also the third largest Hindu state. Monsoon season coincides with important festivals for both faiths. It's the end of Ramadan here, and you can hear the prayer call in the background. This city is bustling right now. Eid Mubarak! Eid Mubarak! And in the Hindu neighborhood, they're celebrating the Rath Yatra festival. It is one of the biggest festivals in the Hindu calendar. And boy, do the Bangladeshis know how to celebrate. The festival is an ode to Jagannath, or Juggernaut, which means unstoppable force. Not unlike the monsoon. But the revelers don't let that stop them. Once unhooked, the chariot temple is pulled to its final destination. This is as far as the chariot is going to come. It's going to sit here for a week. The Jagannath statues are carried through the crowd of devotees to the local temple. That was a world-class grade A sensory overload. An honor to have been here. Just loved it. And we got some monsoon rain. As the heavens open, it's clear to me that the Bangladeshi people are used to persevering in the face of extreme weather. With that in mind, I head north. Resilience and adaptability are two terms that I would definitely use to describe the people that live here. I'm discovering as the flooding here gets worse, Bangladeshis are finding increasingly more innovative ways of adapting. I've traveled to the north, to Pabna, to visit an inspirational education program. So what do you do if you live in a remote, rural part of the country that floods regularly? You've got kids, you need to send them to school. Well, you improvise and innovate. Here, they've come up with the idea of floating schools. In 1998, the first floating school was founded to help the children who were missing out on vital education as schools were frequently flooded. I meet the program's manager, Super crash Paul. Uh, 
They started with one boat, but now have a fleet of 39. There are 22 school boats, 10 library boats, and seven adult education centers. Here in the library boat, we've got all kinds of books for all different ages. We've even got a couple of computers up in the front run by solar power, so it can be operating pretty much anywhere. It's a pretty cool setup. 70,000 kids have benefited from this project. But it's not just classrooms that are floating. Many farms have also been erected above the water. We've got a garden with vegetables. We've got ducks that uh, they keep here for, of course, their eggs and for meat. Being self-sufficient is vital for survival. In each of these ponds, there's fish that they're growing. <laughs> What's clear to me is that the people of Bangladesh have a remarkable character when confronted by extreme weather. From building schools out on the water to finding new ways to grow crops in an ever-increasing environment of unpredictability. As our climate continues to change and the weather becomes more severe, Bangladesh is a country to watch. It's facing the most extreme repercussions of climate change, from severe flooding and erosion to mass displacement. Things we could see across the globe if immediate action is not taken to combat climate change. As global temperatures rise, the polar ice caps are disappearing at an alarming rate. As a result, more and more icebergs are showing up in the warmer waters of Canada. Tracking the growing number of icebergs is crucial because understanding how they move and how they disintegrate is the key to understanding the melting of Arctic ice. I'll see how it's done. From above, the waves just shooting high up into the air up against the bergs. From below, and from the very top of an iceberg on the moon. I'm gonna place the beacon. Melting ice is Earth's warning signal, and icebergs are sounding an alarm bell about our climate's future. I'm in Newfoundland, Canada, on the Atlantic coast, the iceberg capital of the world. Every spring, thousands of icebergs travel from the Arctic down the 1,600-mile stretch of ocean called Iceberg Alley. 1% make it as far south as St. John's. These icebergs are really amazing. Most of them are formed off of the glaciers on western Greenland. They're born when the glaciers calve into the Davis Strait, and a lot of them end up floating south. It's a three-year journey from the Arctic. Circling counterclockwise around Baffin Bay, the icebergs flow into the Labrador Current, which propels them past Newfoundland and Labrador all the way down to the southern tip of the province. They arrive here every year, but their increase in numbers is an ominous indicator of what's happening to the Greenland ice sheet. It's the second largest ice sheet in the world, and it's melting fast, shrinking 47 cubic miles a year. David Barber has been studying the Arctic for 30 years. Well, there's lots and lots of evidence all pointing in exactly the same direction, that climate change is very much alive and well in the Arctic, and it's really affecting the marine cryosphere in general. From snow cover to ice sheets, the cryosphere is the term scientists use for frozen water on the surface of the Earth. And right now, it's in a precarious state. The melting is leading to a rise in ocean levels worldwide a big threat to coastal communities. The warming waters are also affecting global weather patterns. And that's not all. The melting of the Greenland ice sheet is accelerating the production of icebergs. They're massive, they're very dense, and if you're in a ship that hits one of those, it's gonna cause a tremendous amount of damage. Nowhere else in the world do icebergs intersect with major shipping lanes and fishing zones. Collisions can be deadly. It's up to the International Ice Patrol and U.S. Coast Guard to make sure that doesn't happen. And last year was a really crazy year, apparently. Yes, last year uh, was, uh, was the sixth most severe we've had on record since 1900. We had over 1,500 icebergs drift south. Today, I get to see their high-tech iceberg monitoring gear in action. This year, almost 900 bergs have been spotted, and we're only halfway through the season. 
On the plane here today, we've got the pilot, we've got co-pilot, we've got someone operating the radar, and two guys, and all their job is, is to spot icebergs. Icebergs are an extreme hazard, obviously. Just over 100 years ago, the Titanic, probably the most famous shipwreck of all when it comes to iceberg collisions, went down not too far from here. There have been uh, several instances over the last couple of years where ships have deflected off of an iceberg. None of them were damaged so badly that they sank. There have been just over 50 collisions since 1980, causing hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. Tracking buoys with sensors are deployed from the back of the plane. They're designed to read the currents, which help determine where the icebergs are going and how fast. I see them crashing, and the waves just shooting high up into the air up against the bergs. From up here, looking down, it's really hard to tell just how big these icebergs are. Icebergs can vary in size, from that of a small car to ones the size of Manhattan. The Ice Patrol is collecting some of the most detailed information for this area. It's entered into a database and shared internationally with climate scientists studying what happens to icebergs in warmer water. Of course, the Arctic and Antarctic regions are the places on the planet that are most affected by climate change right now. Global temperatures there in the polar regions are about double what they have been. And as temperatures rise, the speed of the glacier will actually increase. And of course, the faster that glacier is moving, the more of that ice is gonna end up in the water each year. Melting Arctic ice disintegrates spectacularly into icebergs. The Peterman Glacier in northern Greenland caught the world's attention in 2010 when satellite images captured a 100 square mile ice island breaking off. Just two years later, another one, 50 square miles, also fell away. Scientists are trying to get an idea of what will happen in the future. Brad DeYoung is a professor of oceanography at Memorial University. What you're always looking for are the big changes, but to determine those, sometimes you have to separate out the kind of the year-to-year -year variability. The variability one might expect to see decade to decade, but the other is the larger scale kind of climate story. In order to understand the rate of change, oceanographers are now studying icebergs in more detail because the way icebergs break up down here mimics the disintegration of the ice shelves in the Arctic. What we want to do is to, is to make measurements on different kinds of bergs in different situations, and also we look at a particular iceberg and ask what's happening to it. And so make repeated measurements of the same iceberg. Right. See how its shape changes, Over time. how it's melting. Melting ice shelves are very bad news. Ice shelves are dense floating sheets of ice at the end of a glacier, sometimes up to 3,000 feet thick. They're vital because they act as a huge doorstop, pushing against the glaciers, slowing their flow into the ocean. Without ice shelves, the glaciers would melt more rapidly into the sea, causing a rise in global sea levels. Today, I'm in Conception Bay at the southeast corner of Newfoundland. I'm taking a closer look at icebergs that have made the 1,600-mile journey from Greenland. I want to see how they travel through these waters. If we've got changes in the environment, such as warmer waters, different currents, different wind patterns, it's going to affect how these icebergs travel through Iceberg Alley. So the mission is to get out and actually climb onto one of these icebergs and place a satellite tracking beacon on it. I'll then be able to track it over the next few days. Captain, iceberg, get ahead. The cold and the beautiful. Without any warning, these bergs can flip, roll over, or break apart. Oh. This will be a climb unlike any I've tried before. Holy crap. I want to get up on the berg and place a beacon on it to track its movement and melt rate. Oh. But it's not going to be easy. Holy crap. What do you think of that, Jerk? Don't want to climb a bird? <laughs> Not that one. That's scary. What was once this towering bird is now this pile of thousands of pieces. Bubbles. Get this effervescent sound, all these bubbles, air bubbles coming up out of the ice. Let's degassing. Wow. With zero warning really drives home how dangerous these things can be when you're up close to them. A 
bit shaken, we move to one that looks promising to climb. That is a beautiful, beautiful iceberg. Hmm. We'll do a circumnavigation. If this iceberg were to roll that way, this piece of ice would come up underneath us. OK, Rick. Hey. I'm going to place the tracking beacon as high as possible, as I want to see how long this berg stays intact and how far it goes. OK. Information like this helps scientists understand the breakup of icebergs. The ice is its a little softer than I was expecting, because it's all melting. All right, continuing up. There's water spray coming up, pressurized up over here. Bird feathers up here. Ah, oh, the angle on this is perfect. It's nice and gentle. What a view. I want to go a little bit further over. I don't dare go any higher up. Too dangerous right here where I'm standing. Here's a good spot right here. All right, just putting an ice screw in right now. Whew. The wind's really picking up here. I'm securing the beacon and tying it off with rope so it can be retrieved later. OK, the rope is in the water. The tracking beacon is retrievable. I'm going to start working my way back. This thing has traveled probably several years down from the Greenland Glacier. Now, let's see where it goes from here. Tracking icebergs is one way to study climate change, but I want to explore other methods that'll take me into dangerous waters. Icebergs offer valuable clues about the melting Arctic ice that spawned them. And it's not just the increase in their numbers that's concerning scientists. It's a coupled system. You can't really look at one part of the thing without looking at all the other parts that are interconnected because they all operate with each other in a very uh, sophisticated harmony. Scientists are noticing that sea ice, the frozen seawater, is also melting fast and raising the temperature of the water around it. When you think about the sea ice, we're thinking right now we're going to have a seasonally ice free Arctic. That stuff that's left at the end of the summer will actually shrink and disappear. You know, somewhere between 2030 and 2050. Disappear completely? Disappear completely in summer. That's scary. The sea ice keeps the oceans cool because when the surface is covered in ice, it's white. So the energy from the sun is reflected back into space, keeping the Arctic cold. But when the ice melts, the heat from the sun is absorbed into the sea, causing it to warm. And when water heats up, it expands, raising sea levels. But that's not the only problem. Melting sea ice and glaciers also change the ocean's currents. In the oceans, we have what's called the thermohaline circulation, the movement of warm water from the equator northward. All that sea and glacier ice melting and mixing together is disrupting those currents. The amount of fresh water that are coming from these things is going to change the circulation patterns of the ocean because the fresh water is very buoyant, and so it tends to come to the surface and the salt water underneath it, which then affects the currents. Scientists predict that 210,000 square miles of polar ice a decade will melt into the ocean. Changing currents will affect world weather patterns causing more ferocious storms and extreme snowfalls. The next morning, I head back to Conception Bay. My mission today is to explore the underwater part of these bergs. The base of an iceberg is rarely ever seen, but how it deteriorates in warming water helps scientists understand future melt rates in the Arctic. We hear the phrase tip of the iceberg all the time, meaning that there's a lot more hidden underneath. 90% of an iceberg is underwater. For the largest bergs, that can be as big as a five-story building. If all goes well today, I'm gonna get to show you what it's like below the surface. A tricky dive, Lots of variables, very cold water. So this should be really interesting. Dive master John Olivero is an experienced iceberg diver. There is going to be a little bit of cracking and popping. Um, if you're concerned of any of the noises, just start swimming away. If you see anything coming down at you, away and down. Away and down. Yeah, it's, it's only dangerous if something goes wrong. Yeah. There we go. 
There's a couple of icebergs out in the bay right now, so we're gonna try and find the best one to go diving on, get in the water, and actually see these things from underneath. It can be hard for scientists to study these giant moving blocks of ice as they're so unpredictable. We need to find one that looks stable enough to dive near. George, I like this one because if it breaks, gravity is going to take it that way. So you guys got lots of chance to swim away. With the bird chosen, we get suited up. Johnny drops a safety buoy, but right away, there's trouble. We reposition further out, and I hit the water. This berg is massive, at least 100 feet deep. It's an incredible sight. The scars of erosion can be seen everywhere, including these cracks and pockmarks all over. Wind, waves, and warm sea temperatures melt away the icebergs, slowly breaking them up. In examining the rate of decline, scientists are also looking at whether or not ocean water changes the way the iceberg melts. The deep icebergs, if they're melting at the bottom, then there's a plume of fresh water that's coming up. And so we want to look at whether the interaction of that with the ocean water changes the way the iceberg itself melts. So is the iceberg kind of influencing its own environment in a way that changes how the melting takes place? If scientists can understand these processes, they can make more accurate predictions for the future of the ice cap. It's a real challenge diving in these conditions. Something's gone wrong, and there's much more at stake now than just our research. I'm diving under an iceberg, getting images of its erosion. But I'm having some serious trouble. Get him out! Get him out! Look at him! I'm very close to being seasick. Yeah. Up, up. I have to call the dive off. The conditions were really difficult down there. Despite all the struggles I was having underwater, it was still a, a sight to behold. Seeing this massive berg underwater, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So <laughs> I still got a lot of fight in me, but not so much more today. After a night of rest, I join a crew on a ship looking for icebergs. But it's not for science. These 10,000-year-old ice blocks happen to contain some of the purest fresh water in the world. And the demand for it is growing. It is very early in the morning, up at 3.30, meeting up with <laughs> the iceberg cowboy, Ed Keen. What we're going to do, he's going to push her around, right? then you guys just slack it out and he'll go around him, right? Just take our time. We're not in no big hurry. We are, but we got to take our time. He's an iceberg wrangler who sells iceberg water. The water is very pure because it's ancient, tens of thousands of years old, and there's a market for it. The crew heads out to capture a bird. We lasso it. We take a rope in the speedboat around and tie it off, and then we use a winch to pull us tight to the iceberg. Nobody owns the icebergs, so it's legal to catch them and break them up before they would naturally melt. But it's a dangerous job. Yeah, you got to treat them with respect. Some big icebergs with uh, pentacles and overhangs on them, and uh, it's just too dangerous. A big barge like this is really difficult to maneuver, so they used a small boat to give it a bit of a nudge to get it perfectly positioned to get the machinery in there to get the ice. We needed to get the barge away from this shelf that's underwater. If this iceberg flips right now, it'll take the barge, the motorboat, and all of us along with it. These guys have learned that lesson the hard way. Last year, we had one roll on us that was, uh, it was, uh, it was pretty bad. Iceberg ice has been compressed for thousands of years, so it's incredibly dense. Ed positions the cranes so the excavator can take the first bites.
Iceberg ice has been locked in ancient glaciers, which formed before the Industrial Age, making it free of contaminants. So right now, he's dropping the ice directly into those front tanks. And then they use the grinder if they want to send it to the tanks at the back, but then shift the weight. And we force water, iceberg water, from the tank in, and it flows down into the other tanks. And how many liters of water will you gather in one season? Oh, we're looking at probably a million, two or three this year. These guys have been at it for about four or five hours now, and they've put a serious dent in that chunk of ice. By late afternoon, they wrap it up and head back to shore with their haul. It's been an adventurous week for me in Iceberg Alley, but before I head home, there's one more place I need to go. I'm going to check on the status of that iceberg I was tracking. So it's been about three days since I put the transmitter on the iceberg up here at Bay de Verde, and an interesting thing has happened. We've had strong winds from the north, which, as you might expect, has pushed that iceberg to the south about halfway into Conception Bay. And last night, it stopped transmitting. The iceberg has probably broken up, and the transmitter is sitting at the bottom of the bay. It traveled almost 15 miles in three days. It really does go to show how much these things move around out here. As icebergs continue to flow into these waters off Newfoundland, they're a mixed blessing. They offer scientists a chance to further understand the process of Arctic melting, but they're also an unmistakable warning about the dramatic decline of our ice sheets. Continuing the detailed research and sharing it worldwide will enhance our ability to combat climate change. Keeping the planet cool by just one to two degrees would help preserve this frozen world. It's gonna cost us a lot more not to do something about this problem than it is for us to do something about this problem, so let's keep our habitat so that it works for us as a, as a species. Scientists have spoken. Now it's time for governments and individuals to take action. Mm -hmm.